Okay, and we should be live. Welcome everyone to another Dental Shadowers virtual session. Um, and thanks so much for tuning in. Um, today we're joined by Dr. Verdon, a pediatric dentist, um, and also a very active voice on social media who disseminates oral health education uh, in a fun and engaging way. Um, Dr. Verdon, thank you so much for meeting with us. Um, please feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Sure. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen because um, I have a little intro and um, presentation from there. So let me go ahead and do that. And does it still, you can still see the screen and everything? Yes. There is a slight lag on the main uh, stream. So let me just double check if it's popping up on the stream okay. Sure. Yes, I think we are good to go. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about pediatric dentistry um, and share some cases with you all tonight. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a pediatric dentist located outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, in terms of my education and background, I went to Virginia Tech for my undergraduate degree. So I'm a big Hokies fan. Um, and then I did my dental degree and my pediatric certificate at the University of Maryland. Um, currently, I work as a pediatric dentist at a practice called Smiles for Children which is actually the practice that I went to as a child. So it's kind of nice to be back and be um, full circle. So I'm very excited to talk with you all tonight. So we'll go ahead and dive in a little bit more. Alrighty, so um, in terms of my journey to pediatric dentistry, I kind of always knew that I wanted to work with children. Um, you know, all the volunteer opportunities that I had were always working with children and volunteering with them. So um, I knew whatever I did in my you know, professional life, I wanted to work with them. Um, and during dentistry, oh, not during dentistry, during college, um, I developed a love for dentistry through volunteering. Um, I was very active with Missions of Mercy, which is, for those of you guys who may not be familiar with it, um, a dental weekend for those who do not have any dental insurance. And so we would literally get hundreds of people showing up in need and in pain and try to help as many of them as we could. And so that really opened my eyes to the need for dentists and the importance of dentistry, not only in oral health, but overall health in general. Um, so I applied to dental school. I was really hoping to get in the first time and I didn't. And I was honestly devastated and it was very um, upsetting, but I like to think of it as, um, you know, a good opportunity. Um, you know, what's the phrase, like if you close a door, you open a window or something like that. And so I tried to use my gap year to figure out, you know, what my calling was in dentistry and if it was really for me and really something I wanted to do. Um, during that gap year, I worked as a pediatric dental assistant at the practice that I actually work at now. And I fell in love with pediatric dentistry. I thought, you know, helping kids get through treatment successfully, helping to shape their view of dentistry as they grow up and get older, um, I thought was really wonderful. And the procedures were interesting and getting to talk to kids. Um, you know, they're just so fun to talk to. You could be talking about unicorns with one child and then another child's getting ready to go to college. So um, I really love that. So I worked really hard to improve my TAT score and to improve, um, you know, other areas that I felt like I was deficient that first time around I got in. Um, and then once I was in dental school, I tried to tailor all of my experiences to pediatric dentistry because I knew right from the get go that that was something that I wanted to do. And that was what I wanted to specialize in when I was done with dental school. Um, and then after I graduated dental school, I was lucky enough to match to Maryland and did my training there and um, actually served as chief resident there. So um, all over, you know, kind of always knew I wanted to work with children and then had a little setback. But um, now that I'm in pediatric dentistry, I love it and think that year that I didn't get in was actually really, really worthwhile. So what is pediatric dentistry and what is a pediatric dentist? So pediatric dentistry is an age-defined specialty. We see children from a few days old all the way into young adulthood. We also see um, adults with special health care needs. So we'll typically follow them from childhood to adulthood 
until they have needs that um, you know are out of our scope of practice. Um, to become a pediatric dentist, it's an extra two years of residency, and you'll get extra training in classes like child development, behavior management. You'll learn a lot about special health care needs. And we're also trained in oral sedation, IV sedation, and um, hospital dentistry. So for some children who have a lot of cavities or they have significant health care needs, we end up taking them to the hospital to do treatment. And so we have um, hospital privileges with that that we learn about in our residency training. So advice for college, um, I would say this is just very general advice. Um, one would be to take care of yourself. It's really easy to get, you know, stressed out wanting to do your best. And of course, you know, of course you want to do your best, but you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't, you know, keep going when you have no more else left to give. So make sure to take care of yourself, take time off, do things that you enjoy, hang out with friends and family, um, do things that really fill your cup back up so that when you go back to studying or you go back to those classes, you are, um, you're engaged and invigorated and ready to go. Um, I would say get involved in extracurricular activities and volunteering that you're passionate about. It doesn't necessarily need to all be dentistry focused. Um, I find when we're looking at applications for dental students and for residents, we want a well-rounded person. So, you know, whatever you enjoy, um, you know, whatever your passions are, take time to explore those and to develop those. Um, Oh, that's a little spelling error there. Um, it should say, don't compete, collaborate. Um, I think, you know, it's easy to get competitive when we're trying to think about class rank and wanting to do well and wanting to get into top-notch programs. But the best way to get there really is to collaborate with others and to form a team and have a group effort. Um, you know, I find we can get a lot farther together than alone. So that would be one thing I would think about. Um, seek out shattering opportunities, kind of like what you all are doing right now tonight to see what parts of dentistry interest you. And then don't give up on being on your dream of being a dentist if a test or a class isn't going well or if you don't get in the first time. Um, you know, if you want it and you put your mind to it, you can do it. You just may have to reassess and, um, you know, take a step back, see what you can improve, but you can definitely do it and make it as a dentist. So don't get discouraged if something doesn't go well the first time around. So what does a typical day look like in pediatric dentistry? So this picture that's um, on the left is the office that I work for. And that was our Christmas party, holiday party last year. Um, so we're all like one kind of big family, which is really nice. Um, so my work week, and typically I find pediatric dentists will work three to four days a week. Um, so I work four days a week. I have off on Wednesdays and I work every other Saturday till 1 p.m. Um, my Wednesdays, hopefully eventually once COVID kind of goes down a little bit, will be used to see cases in the hospital. Um, but right now there's a little lag because, you know, they have other cases that need to get in and things like that. We do take call. So call is for any after hours emergency. So um, you know, a patient who falls, if they hit their face or if they have a swelling, um, we would see them and we're always available for our patients. So once a week for, um, you know, any time after the office is closed every seven weeks. So it's not, not too bad in residency. It was a lot more frequent than that. So this is pretty good. Um, a typical day for me starts around 745. We have a group huddle um, and we usually are done with patients by 5 p.m. So we try to keep our fillings and tooth removals and sealants and everything in the morning because we find kids are a little bit more fresh in the morning. They're a little bit more well rested. Um, just, you know, in terms of behavior management, we're always thinking about what's best for children and how they do best and be most successful. So we do fillings and things from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and then we have exams and cleanings all day long from 8 to 5. And we typically see about I would say maybe 20 to 35 patients for myself per day. And then the other dentists that I work with would see about the same. Um, with COVID, of course, that's a little bit less or a lot less, I should say. Um, but that's kind of how when things are at their most busy, that's kind of how it is. Um, and then we do oral sedation. We have an oral sedation spot every day at 9 a.m. 
So basically what that is just very quickly is um, we'll have the child have a sedative medicine that they'll take orally, takes about an hour for it to work. And then we monitor their heart, their breathing, everything um, for the hour that we're working until they go home. And that just enables us to help the child relax enough that we can do dentistry successfully and help them get through treatment successfully. So we don't do it on all children. We don't do it necessarily every single day, but um, if a child needs it, if we think it would be helpful for them, then we certainly um, explore that option and have time in our schedule for it. So I would say the most kind of um, common complaints that we get um, would be definitely dental trauma. So when our office was closed, um, a lot of kids were playing outside because everything was closed. So we would get a lot of bike falls, a lot of sports injuries, um, running into things like walls, toys, sides of, you know, chairs, anything that you can run into. Um, we've seen it, you know, anything that a child can hit and fall. So definitely have a lot of dental trauma that comes in and we have to evaluate that and kind of see um, how we can best treat it. Um, of course, we see children who have dental pain, um, cavities, infection, swelling, um, loose teeth. A lot of parents get really concerned when um, children have baby teeth that are loose and the adult teeth start to come in behind it. So a lot of our emergencies or patient complaints or exams that we see that are limited exams will be for that. And then probably the fourth most common one is parents and patients wondering when they can start orthodontics and when they can get their braces. So I would say those are the top, um, top four areas of um, pediatric dental complaints that we get on a daily basis. In terms of what procedures a pediatric dentists perform, we basically do a lot of different kinds of procedures, um, you know, just depending. So in terms of restorative, we do regular white composite fillings. We place protective sealants on the teeth. Um, if the cavity is very large, we will place a stainless steel crown on the tooth. And they also have white crowns now, which are more aesthetic and more pretty looking. Um, we do a little bit of oral surgery. So we take out not only baby teeth, but um, adult teeth sometimes. Um, we will do excisions, like if we have, you know, a swelling or something or um, something that's unusual on the gum tissue or on the lip tissue, we can excise it, take it off and send it to the lab for a report. And we also do tongue and lip tie release. So a lot of times this is when we'll see our very, very young patients, like a couple of days old, is if mom is having difficulty breastfeeding or um, difficulty with the baby latching or getting enough um, nutrients, then we may release a tongue tie there. The other time that we may release lip and tongue ties if we're having, if patients having problems with speech and they've been evaluated by a speech therapist or after a patient's had braces and they're a little bit older and um, they are still having a thick tissue in between their two front teeth, we may release that frenum then too. In terms of orthodontics, um, some pediatric dentists have Invisalign training, um, so they're able to do that. Um, but the biggest thing that pediatric dentists do is make what's called space maintainers. Um, which help to hold the space for adult teeth if a baby tooth is lost early. And then we also do some pharmaco pharmacologic behavior management, and that would be the oral sedation. So taking sedative medicine by mouth, IV sedation, or general anesthesia. And of course, with IV sedation and general anesthesia, we would probably work with a um, nurse anesthetist or a dental anesthesiologist or the hospital anesthesiologist for those two. But the oral sedation, we can give ourselves as pediatric dentists once we have our um, certification. Um, in terms of what diagnostic tests and instruments are used in pediatric dentistry, um, we'll of course use a mirror and explore to look at the teeth. We take dental x-rays to give us information about um, what's going on underneath the gums and in the bone that we can't necessarily see. Um, in terms of pulp testing, so seeing if the nerve of the tooth is alive or dead or inflamed, um, we tap on the to tooth, so we percuss the tooth um, in baby teeth and we also feel along the gum line. Um, and so those are actually two very simple things that can give us a lot of information on the health and the 
vitality of the nerve of the tooth. And then for older children, we may place something cold on the tooth to see if it bothers them or doesn't bother them or if they feel it. And then probably one of the biggest things that we use is patient history from both parents and patients. Little children aren't necessarily the best historians, so we rely heavily on parents and caregivers for that. But that would probably be the most um, common and most frequent dental instruments and tests used um, other than a mirror and explorer, of course. So just to touch on some new technology used in pediatric dentistry, um, one is silver diamine fluoride, which has actually been used as an anti-sensitivity agent for over 40 years, but recently is becoming very popular as a way to stop the progression of cavities um, without drilling, without numbing. So for very young children with a lot of cavities, like a two-year-old who has cavities all over their front teeth, this is a very good option for them because their behavior is not quite ready yet to have drilling and numbing and putting a filling in. So this can buy us time until we are able to fix the tooth to stop the decay from spreading. The other um, one I wanna talk about are white crowns. So the white zirconia crown, zirconia is a type of material used to fabricate crowns actually in adult teeth, uh, but now they're making them for the pediatric teeth. They're very aesthetic, um, but they do require a lot of tooth removal. So you have to shave down the tooth more, um, but they are really, really pretty looking. Um, and then new developments in pediatric pulp therapy. So, um, you know, we do perform baby root canals and baby partial root canals, um, but research is coming out more and more that shows us we don't necessarily need to remove um, all of the cavity in a tooth. Um, we can do what's called an indirect pulp cap and that also has good success in terms of doing that versus getting into the nerve of the tooth and doing a partial baby root canal. And so I'll go into each of these a little tiny bit more. So for the first one, silver diamine fluoride, um, the first picture that you see is just a picture before and after of what silver diamine fluoride looks like. So it stops the progression of decay using silver um, ions and fluoride ions. Um, and it does turn the area where the cavities are only where the cavities are a black color and that is permanent. So we do let parents know that. Um, so silver ions are antimicrobial and the fluoride obviously interacts with the tooth structure to help strengthen it. Um, and so it has been shown to stop the progression of decay. Typically what we'll do is put um, it on for one minute and then we'll cover it with a fluoride um, coating, like a fluoride varnish coating, and then have the patient come back in a month um, and check and make sure that there's a color change and everything like that. Um, so this is a very good option, like I said, for patients who are very young or for patients who have cavities that are small enough that we can try to arrest them or stop the progression um, before they get large enough to need a filling. Um, also good for patients with special health care needs who may not be able to go to the OR, they may not be able to have treatment done. Um, this kind of gives us a lot of time and helps to stop the, de the decay in the cavity from growing. So this is a great option that's being used more and more in pediatric dentistry. The next one is the white um, crowns, the zirconia crowns. And so if you look at the first picture by Dr. Ted Kroll, who's a really good pediatric dentist, I believe he's up in Connecticut, you'll see the traditional stainless steel crown. Um, that would be typically what we would do if there was a very large cavity. And then right next to that, you'll see the white crown. You can tell it's a lot more aesthetic. It looks really, really pretty and nice. Um, but like I said, it does take a lot more to structure. And then if you look at the other picture, you'll see um, the new smile crowns, those two front teeth, those are um, the zirconia crowns, and then you'll see a bottom tooth. Um, the difference is back in the day before white crowns, we would typically, if the teeth had very large cavities, do stainless steel um, front tooth crowns, which parents were not always very happy about. They're not very aesthetic. Um, and then there's the open face crowns, which is where you put a stainless steel crown on, you cut the um, front off of it and then you fill it with tooth filling material, which is a little bit more aesthetic, but you can still kind of see the grain along the margin. Um, so the white crowns are definitely the most aesthetic option that we have for crowns in pediatric dentistry. 
And then the last one is updates to vital pulp therapy. And I'll just touch on this very briefly. Um, vital pulp therapy is treatment to the nerve of the tooth that you do while the tooth is still alive, basically. Um, and so it used to be that our only option was to do what's called a pulpotomy, which is a partial baby root canal. Um, now, research is finding that an indirect pulp cap actually has better success rate than a pulpotomy um, for, some tooth, for some teeth. So an indirect pulp cap is where you remove most of the decay, um, but you leave a layer of um, like leathery looking decay over top of the nerve. And then you place a medicine over top of that and then you put your filling on. So um, I think there's a systematic review research study going on right now looking at all of these, but um, the indirect pulp cap has had very promising results. So our hope is that we can be a little bit more conservative with the baby teeth um, and use the indirect pulp cap more frequently. So those are just three things that are kind of coming, either coming down the pipe or being used more and more. Um, that I thought were interesting in pediatric dentistry. Um, so four important terms in pediatric dentistry. Um, I think while it's important to know the clinical terms or, <coughs> excuse me, to know, you know, the exact right name of things, I think what's more important for us as pediatric dentists is knowing how to explain procedures to children in a way that they can understand and in a way that's age appropriate. Um, so of course I have a list on the right side. And of course for like a 16 year old, you're not gonna call um, the fluoride tooth vitamins or the suction little Slurpee, but for a four year old or a two year old or a six year old, you may use some of these words because I can you know, tell a four year old, we're gonna take your dental x-rays and they, probably won't understand what that means or really know. But if I tell them I'm going to take tooth pictures, that may be something that they can understand. So I think, um, you know, behavior management and getting children through treatment successfully and setting them up for a lifetime of dental health is very important. And one way we can do that is by using child-friendly dental terms and explaining treatment and procedures um, in a way that the child can understand and kind of grasp what's going to happen. So these are all um, terms that I use on a daily basis. Um, I find that it's very helpful and very clear that children understand what's going on. I also let children see some of the things that we'll be using. Um, like a slow speed drill, I'll show them on their nail how that feels. The high speed drill that sprays water and whistles, um, we'll talk about that. That's a little whistle brush or a little electric toothbrush. Um, and those kinds of things just help children better understand and feel more comfortable with what's going on. So they're not as scared or as afraid of the unknown. So those are, I would say, very important terms in pediatric dentistry. Alrighty, so um, now we're gonna transition to um, just an intro to dental terms, just to kind of get our bearings. And I'm sure you guys have seen this before, so it's probably review. Um, and then I have two dental cases to share with you. So this is just a very um, brief overview to dental anatomy. Obviously we have the crown of the tooth. That's what you can see when you look in the mirror and you smile. And then you have the root of the tooth in the bone underneath the gum. Um, so we have the outer enamel layer. And then next to that, we have the dentin, and that's right under the enamel, and then the pulp, which houses the um, nerves and the blood supply, and then the cementum that covers the root of the tooth. So I always think about this like a peanut M&M. You know, you have the outside that's, you know, really bright and colorful. That's the enamel. The chocolate is the dentin, and then the peanut on the inside is the pulp. And that's, I don't know why, that's something I've always thought of, I guess, because I like sweets and things like that. <laughs> Um, and then we have the types of teeth. Um, so each tooth shape and each tooth performs a different function. Um, so we have our front tooth, which is for like biting or incising, um, which is good to remember because it's an incisor. So that makes it easy. We have our canine, similar function to incisors. And that's, you know, the canines are the cornerstone of the arch. They have very long roots and they kind of set the smile profile and everything like that. We have the premolars, um, which tear and grind food. 
Um, interestingly, in the primary or baby tooth dentition, there are no premolars. There are only incisors, canines, and molars. And then we have our back molars, and those um, obviously grind and help us chew our food. Alrighty, so these are the primary and the permanent teeth. Um, and this is just to kind of give you an idea of when the teeth start coming in. So baby teeth typically start coming in around six months, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. Um, I recently had a 13 month old that just got their first tooth. So it's all in a bell curve of normal. Typically um, boys get teeth later than girls. Girls are usually earlier. So just some things to think about. And then we typically start getting our adult teeth around age six with the eruption of the six year molars. Um, and so as you can see the primary versus the permanent, there aren't any premolars in the primary teeth. Alrighty, and so this is just a quick introduction to dental pathology. There's way, way more things that I could go over than this, but these are just some um, interesting images I just wanted to share with you. Um, so we can have extra teeth called supernumerary teeth or hyper, hyperdontia. Um, there's some conditions that can have um, supernumerary teeth like Gardner syndrome, cleft lip and palate can, um, cladocranial dysplasia can. Um, there's teeth, uh, missing teeth. So if you look at image two, hypodontia, this patient has um, their baby molar still, but they don't have any premolar, so they're missing some teeth. Some conditions that can be related with that are also cleft lip and palate and also um, ectodermal dysplasia. Um, you can have larger than normal tooth size. So that's image three, that's macrodontia. That front tooth is larger than the tooth next to it. So we would call that a macrodontia tooth. And then you can have teeth that are smaller than normal size. So microdontia. So if you see that little peg shaped tooth, that's what we call a peg lateral. And so that's an example of microdontia. Alrighty. Um, and then we have different types of dental x-rays. So in the cases, you'll see different types of images. So I just want to go over what those were called here. And again, um, this may be review for you guys, but just wanted to have it in here. Um, so we have bite wings. So image one is a bite wing x-ray and it's used to look for cavities, bone height and calculus. So you can see this patient does have some cavities, um, which they hopefully will get restored. And um, so these are really good images straight on of the molars, um, premolars, and should be the canine, but we don't have that in that image. Um, periapical x-rays show the crown and root of between one to three teeth. So that's image two. Um, you can see that's the molars and you can see all the way down to the end of the root there. Um, we have maxillary or mandibular occlusals. So that's image three. And in those pictures, we use this a ton in pediatric dentistry for trauma. Um, we're always looking at if a baby tooth gets um, knocked or bumped or hit, where is that root in relation to the adult tooth? Um, because when we have an impact to the baby teeth that can cause the root to go towards the adult tooth, which can cause problems to the adult tooth um, at the time of impact. Um, so that's what that image is. Um, and then we have a panorex and that shows all of the teeth at one time. Um, and it shows the sinuses, the nose, the condyles of the jaw. Um, and so we use this to determine growth and development, to do timing for orthodontics, to look for extra teeth. Um, if we have, if we suspect a jaw fracture. So we use these um, for lots of different purposes. All right, so um, we're gonna go into case one. Um, and so we'll talk about that. And then I guess if anybody wants to answer the questions, you can, if not, you don't have to. I just have them in here um, in case anybody wants to discuss, that's totally fine. Um, so a little bit of background about this patient. Um, they're a seven year old male and they came to the dental clinic with a chief complaint um, that they felt something was bothering their tongue behind their front tooth. Like their tongue was getting very um, curious about what was going on behind the front tooth and it felt kind of funny back there. Um, talked about the patient's history with their caregiver. No um, significant medical history. They're overall a healthy child with no allergies and they're not taking any medications. 
Um, and so I guess you guys can just think about what um, questions that you would ask to get to know the patient more. You don't necessarily have to answer unless you want to, but start thinking about that and then we'll go into the dental exam. So you complete an extra oral exam. So you're looking at the outside structures outside of the mouth on the um, head and neck, and you don't see anything significant. There's no swellings, no lacerations, um, nothing like that. Um, and then you complete an intraoral exam. So looking at structures inside of the mouth. Um, and you see that the patient is in mixed dentition. So they have some primary teeth or baby teeth and some permanent or adult teeth. Uh, which is very normal for seven years old. Um, you don't notice anything like a swelling or any large cavities um, or anything like that or any lacerations on the gums. Um, on the lower arch, so this is a picture of the upper arch. On the lower arch, you don't see anything unusual. Um, but then you start to look at the maxillary arch or the upper arch and you see something behind one of the front teeth. And it looks very similar in color and hardness and texture to the teeth. So um, you may be thinking you wanna take an image of that tooth and so you decide to. And this is what you see on the x-ray. So um, you, know, you can take an image of that, get a better look. This is one of the times that we'll take actually a periapical because they're in their adult teeth. So a max occlusal may not show this. And so we see the two front teeth and we see something in the middle. Um, and so it looks like it's a tooth. Um, so thinking about the diagnosis for this patient, um, we would call this an extra or supernumerary tooth. Um, for extra or supernumerary teeth in the um, anterior, those are actually called mesiodens. So this is a supernumerary tooth called a mesiodens. Um, and then the treatment actually will vary depending on the situation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But for this tooth, um, it was extracted. So plan to remove it. And so this is, that's the tooth on the little piece of gauze. You can see the extraction site there. Um, and then the post-op x-ray where the extra tooth is no longer present. Um, and so this is an example where we can see the mesiodens, we can easily grab it with our oral surgery forceps and take it out. Um, so this is an example of oral surgery that pediatric dentists do. Um, so just a little bit of information about mesiodens and here are some extra pictures of some more mesiodens just so you can see how they show up clinically, they may look a little different and how they can show up on the x-rays. Um, and if you see E and F are the two baby front teeth, eight and nine are the adult front teeth, and that S is supernumerary. Um, so like I said, mesiodens are supernumerary teeth located in the anterior. 82% of the time they're in the maxillary anterior. Um, every time that I've seen them, always in the maxillary anterior. I haven't seen any yet that are in the bottom in the mandibular anterior. 25% of mesiodens Mesiodens erupt spontaneously, so they come into their mouth on their own, just like any other tooth. Um, and their most common shape is pig shape or conical shape, which is how the one that was extracted was shaped and how basically all of these ones that you see are shaped. They're all the conical shape. Um, and then if you look at the Panorex picture, so that top picture where it has the A, you can see the mesiodens kind of hiding out between the roots of the adult teeth that are supposed to be there. And we'll talk about what we would do in that case in a little bit. So the reason that we care about mesiodens and want to figure out how we need to treat the mesiodens is because they can cause a lot of co complications if, you know, they're in the way. Um, so one of the things that can happen is they can delay the eruption of the permanent teeth. So they can block the entrance of those teeth that we need to come in. The other one is they can cause crowding. Um, they can impact the teeth. So if they're slanted, just like this picture, the adult tooth then is blocked out and can't come in. So that's called impaction. Um, they can cause altered path of eruption. So you can have an adult tooth come in in a totally different spot than what you want because that supernumerary tooth is in the way. Um, they can form cysts or cysts can form around the supernumerary tooth. 
and it can um, resorb the surrounding teeth, the surrounding tooth roots. So kind of like erasing those adult teeth roots down. So we definitely want to keep track of any mesiodens and treat them if they need to be treated. Um, and so mesiodens can be found on clinical exam if they're one of the 25% that come in on their own or on radiographic exam on a panorex, a max occlusal, periapical, or 3D imaging. Um, so with mesiodens, you can either extract or monitor, and that just totally depends on the situation. Um, so you want to consider extraction if the mesiodens is in the way and it's preventing an adult tooth from coming in, if it's moving other teeth in the area around, if there's a cyst that forms, or if it's causing resorption, or if it's coming in on its own and you can see it and grab it and take it out. Um, so that's what was done in the first case. We were able to see it, grab it, take it out. Um, you wanna consider monitoring if there's no pathology present, if the adult teeth erupt with no problems and they're all in alignment exactly where they should be, um, if there's no risk of damage to surrounding teeth, um, or if they're symptomless. So sometimes we'll find these extra mesiodens on a random x-ray that we take and we never knew that they were there and they're there and they're fine and they're not in the way. And so we just leave them. We tell the patient, we inform the patient and then we just monitor it. And if it becomes a problem, we have it removed. But usually those ones that you find randomly on an x-ray usually don't cause problems. So that was the first case. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I think supernumerary teeth and oral pathology in general is very interesting. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, and then we'll go into our second case. And so um, we have another patient introduction. So you're on call and it's 8 p.m. and you get a call on the after hours emergency line, which often happens. Um, the mother on the end is very frantic and she's very upset. And she says, help, my child fell and knocked out his tooth. I can't find the tooth anywhere. So you on the phone get some important patient information. You find out that they're a 15-month-old male. Um, they were playing with a rocking horse and fell into the rocking horse, bumping their teeth on it. Um, the parent noticed bleeding from the maxillary arch and the upper lips. So around the gum on the um, where the teeth were and on the limb. Um, you ask if there's any loss of consciousness um, or any signs of a concussion. Um, and there's no loss of consciousness, no vision changes or no nausea. And you look in your chart and then you go through medical history and this patient is a healthy child. Um, so I want you to start thinking about what um, other questions would you wanna ask mom to just gather more information about um, what happened and about the patient and anything like that. So, um, you know, start thinking what kinds of questions and things do you have for mom? Alrighty. So then we go to the clinical exam. Um, and this is what you see when you look at the um, patient. Obviously, we wiped all the blood off. You know, they're all cleaned up now. Um, they're in your office. You came in at 8 p.m. Um, so you find an upper lip laceration, um, missing front tooth E. So you don't see their upper right front tooth. And the gums look very red, swollen, and they're bleeding. They're kind of oozy, um, which in this picture, you did a good job wiping them off with gauze before you took the picture. Um, and the other uh, front teeth in the area look kind of loose. Um, so this is what you see. And then what might you want to do next? So you can think about that for a minute, what you might want to do. And you decide to take an x-ray. Um, so this would be a max occlusal. It's a little bit blown up so you can't see um, the whole thing, but you can see the important area. So you have mom sit with the patient. So she helps to hold the patient. They both get lead aprons and then you take a max occlusal. And you see that that baby tooth actually hasn't been lost, but instead what happened is when um, little Johnny fell and hit the rocking horse, that baby tooth got knocked up into the gum, up into the bone of the tooth, um, or up into the bone of the mouth. 
So you inform mom that the baby tooth is still present. It's actually now present all the way up in that bone. And so in terms of treatment, like we talked about, you discuss with mom that the primary tooth E has been intruded. Um, so what you recommend is to allow that tooth to re-erupt, to give it time to come back down and come into the mouth. And we talk about signs and symptoms of infection um, to monitor and to look out for. And that includes abscesses, swelling, um, spontaneous or nocturnal pain, um, you know, red, angry gums. Um, so those are all things that mom needs to look out for because if we see those, then we're gonna need to do something else. Um, we also tell mom that it's important for us to see that patient frequently to evaluate that that front tooth is coming down. Um, so we want to see them at one week, six months, and then a year, along with regular exams. So when they come for their six-month cleaning, we'll look at it again. And then when they come a year from that visit, we'll look again and see how the tooth is coming in. And then we also discuss possible damage to the developing adult tooth, because if you look, and I'll try to go back, those adult teeth up top are just starting to develop. So we always tell parents, whenever there's an injury to a front tooth where it's gotten either knocked up or knocked out, or you know it's kind of in a different position, we always talk about that at the time of impact, that there could be damage to the adult tooth where the root of the baby tooth hit that adult tooth. Um, so we always let them know that. So this is in a year. So you see them, they followed up every time. Um, and this is at their one year checkup. Um, and you can see that that baby tooth has come down all the way again. It's re-erupted. It's a little bit more yellow than the tooth next to it. But other than that, I mean, I'd say this was a very successful case of intrusion. Um, sometimes you're not that lucky in getting the um, baby tooth to come back down or having it come down as much as it did here. But you can see after a year, that baby tooth has come down and it's back in the mouth. And so now we're just watching it and hoping that there isn't any infection later on or the tooth doesn't, you know, the nerve of the tooth doesn't die or anything like that. But for right now, the tooth looks good. The gum tissue looks good. And on the x-ray, everything looks good. Um, so just to share a little bit more information about what um, steps you take when you do have a patient that calls with a trauma, um, you want to use a structured approach. So we'll just talk about trauma in dental in dentistry in general, I'm sure this is similar for general dentistry, but definitely for pediatric dentistry. Um, no matter what the trauma is, you wanna use a structured systematic approach so you don't miss anything. Um, so the first thing you wanna do obviously is take a medical dental history, um, learn more about the patient, learn if they have any medication allergies, if they have any significant medical conditions that you would also need to manage. Um, you wanna look at the social history, including the caregivers, who do they live with, where were they, um, look at you know all of that information. And then you wanna get information about what happened with the trauma. So the who, what, when, where, or any medications given at the scene, was any medical um, you know, procedures done prior to you seeing them, um, any signs of concussion, any signs of nerve damage, any possible jaw fractures. So you want to get all of that information before you ever look at the patient for an exam or ever take an x-ray. Um, you want to do your clinical exam looking at the soft tissue. So you want to look extra orally at the face, the ears, the neck. Um, for pediatric dentists, this is especially important because we are mandated reporters for child abuse. So um, for every trauma, we also have to kind of really look at the history, make sure that the injuries match up with what the parent or patient is telling us, and also evaluate always for any signs of abuse or neglect because we are mandated reporters. Um, and then you wanna look at the hard tissue, the tooth, you wanna look at mobility, is the tooth fractured? Is it discolored? Is the nerve alive? Is the nerve dead? Um, and you wanna look at both the affected teeth and the unaffected teeth. Um, after you do a clinical exam, um, then you'll take any x-rays that you need. Um, and sometimes we'll take 
x-rays of soft tissue. If we think there's part of a tooth in the lip, um, we'll take an x-ray to see so we can get the part of the tooth out of the lip or the part of the gravel out or anything that may be stuck in the um, soft tissue. Um, once you collect all the data, then you can start to make a diagnosis, but you definitely want to have a systematic approach to doing that um, so that you don't miss any important information. Um, and then this is a little bit more about intrusive um, injuries in primary teeth. So I think this is a really great picture to just kind of visualize what's happening. So clinical findings, you may not see the tooth at all. Like the mom called and said the tooth was knocked out when in fact it was up in the bone. Um, so you may see it a little bit, you may not see it at all. Um, and it can be displaced towards the adult tooth, or it can be displaced towards the bone um, on the lip side. So it can be displaced towards bone or the tooth. And so it's important to determine where that tooth is in relation to it. Um, so you want to take an x-ray. Um, when the baby tooth is displaced towards the bone, um, the tooth looks shorter, and you can see all the end of the tooth. So if you look at that x-ray that's there, that baby tooth looks shorter and you can see the whole end of the tooth. So that is probably displaced towards the bone. Um, if it's displaced towards the adult tooth, it will look longer and you can't see the very end, the very tip of that root of the baby tooth. So that's one way of kind of knowing where that primary tooth is in space and if it's closer to the adult tooth or closer to the bone. Um, so those are just some things that we think about. We definitely always want to take an x-ray and just evaluate and see what's going on um, underneath the gums and in the bone where we can't see clinically. Um, and then here's another um, picture of the tooth coming down. Um, so we have an image two months, three months, and one year. And you can take a look at those um, x-rays. They're pretty neat looking. Um, so treatment, just like we did, um, for the on-call case, um, you allow the tooth to reposition itself um, because you don't wanna go up there with forceps and try to get that baby tooth out because you could end up causing more damage to the permanent tooth. Um, so like I talked about before, any damage that is done to the permanent tooth happened at the time of impact. So when little Johnny, as soon as that tooth hit that rocking chair, whatever damage that was gonna happen to the adult tooth happened at that time. Um, so that's why we allow, depending on no matter which way that um, root apex is tilted, we allow it to come back down. Um, it can take a while for those teeth to re-erupt. So it can take six months to a year. Um, so you want to always let the parent know that because some parents will think it will come down in a week and then they're very upset when that week goes by and it's not there. So I always tell parents worst case scenario that it's going to take a year. And then if it's less than that, great. If it's right up to that time, great, then they're informed. Um, some other things to tell parents is um, you can consider some soft food. Um, you want to be gentle with that area as the tooth is coming back in. Um, you want to keep the area clean um, because that gets plaque away. So that removes the bacteria and that can help with healing. And you can give like children's Motrin or Tylenol as needed. Um, and then reevaluation one week, you could do six to eight weeks and then six months in a year. So we have unfavorable outcomes and favorable outcomes. We wanna let parents know about both. Um, so our favorable outcomes would obviously be the tooth coming in, the adult tooth that may have gotten hit continues to develop normally, um, and the baby tooth, the nerve of the baby tooth is alive and it's healing. Unfavorable outcomes, pulp necrosis, meaning the nerve of the tooth is died or it becomes infected, or we see the adult tooth not developing further. Um, and that we would just watch and see what happens once the adult tooth came in. Um, but if the baby tooth starts to get an abscess infection or the nerve dies, we probably would recommend removing that tooth early. Um, so those are just some things to think about with trauma. And there's lots of different types of trauma, lots of different types of ways that children um, hurt and fracture their teeth and fall and run into things. But um, I thought this was an interesting case and I thought it had a really positive result that the tooth was able to come in pretty much all the way back to where it was because we don't always have that. So those are my two cases. 
Um, and now I just want to wrap up with some advice to you guys as future dentists. And then, of course, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you have. But um, hope those two cases were interesting. Um, I kind of think oral pathology and trauma are very interesting facets of pediatric dentistry. Um, so I included some pictures from my residency program because I absolutely loved it and thought it was a great two years. Um, but my advice to you all would be um, to always remember that you're treating the person first, not the teeth. So you always want to look at it, um, you know, like the tooth is part of a whole person and we want to take care of that whole person. Um, so I know um, when you guys are in dental school, you may start to think about things in terms of requirements like, oh, this is my root canal patient or this is my board's patient. But we always want to remember that they're a person first. Um, always try to do the right thing. You know, um, I think we're dealing with people's teeth, we're dealing with their oral health. So we always want to make sure that we're trying to do the right thing for them and not trying to, you know, shortchange them or do something because it's easier. Um, we always want to do what's best for our patients. Um, in terms of dental school, you get out what you put in. So the more that you give into learning a new procedure, a patient experience, or an activity, the more you get, um, you know, and that goes for clinic time, study time, volunteering activities. Um, the more that you are willing to kind of be active in those things, I find the more that you'll get out of it, the more that you'll learn and grow. Um, I said this in the college portion, um, I think collaboration over competition. Um, definitely in dental school, you know, I'm sure you guys, if you're on social media and you follow any dental meme page, have seen memes about gunners and um, things like that. And it definitely is a real thing. Um, but I think it's better to work together than to work apart and compete. So that's just the thought that I have. I've always had a lot of success working in groups, study groups and, and things like that. Um, definitely for dental school, it can be a little bit like drink, trying to drink out of a fire hydrant at first with all the information. So again, same as the advice in college, just want to take care of yourself and, um, you know, really take care of your needs and things like that and your health and mental health, um, and relaxation. Cause those are very important. And then finally, believe in yourself. Um, dental school is really hard. Um, but you know, you have to believe that you can do it. Everybody gets through it. Um, so even though it may be very challenging at times, you can do it. Um, you just got to believe in yourself and give yourself a little bit more credit than you think you deserve. And then that is, um, all that I had. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, this was really fun and I'm just going to switch it off of the presentation back to my camera. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Bird. And we sure. actually recently shared um, an informational post um, on our page about dental anomalies, which included supernumerary teeth. Cool. So it was sort of Yay. great to see um, case one in practice clinically. Nice. But um, cool. at this point, I'll turn it over to our chat moderator, Yoon, and we can address a few questions from the chat before we conclude. Cool, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that awesome presentation. We do have a few questions. Um, so I guess we can start off with, can you talk more about your experience as a dental assistant, such as if you would recommend it or if you need any certification to work as a pediatric dental assistant? Sure. So um, I think I've seen it both ways. So I would definitely recommend it. It is a way to get right up close and personal to those procedures, because I know when you're shadowing, you're kind of like back behind the dentist and the assistant. But if you're actually doing the assisting, you can kind of see everything that's happening. So I would recommend if you have the opportunity to, I know things are different with COVID, um, but I did not get any certifications for it. I kind of just talked to my childhood dentist and said, hi, I didn't get into dental school. I'm so sad, help me. And <laughs> let me do this opportunity. And it was amazing. So I would say it never hurts to ask. The worst that can happen is they tell you no. Um, and so I think if you want to definitely ask, I know some practices have asked the, um, like people who are doing a gap year to either get x-ray certified or to take a limited dental assisting class. So I would just see, I did not, 
Um, but I don't, I can't speak for every dental practice, but I would recommend it. Um, another question that we have is, do you treat children before they have teeth? Um, hmm. I don't think I ever have. There are some conditions. There's these things called gingival cysts of the newborn, um, which are like these little bumps on the ridges of the teeth. And so um, in residency, we got a on call for that. They had bumps on their gum. Um, but typically no, but sometimes with like weird things like that, that'll pop up. Um, we will, but usually um, we may see kids before they have teeth in terms of tongue tie or lip tie. Um, so if a baby's having difficulty breastfeeding, then they'll come to the office and we would do a lip tie or tongue tie release and then go from there. Um, the only other time I would say we saw like a three or four day old is sometimes babies are born with teeth, um, like one tooth right here. And if it's very loose and like flapping in the wind or it could be an aspiration risk, then we'll take that out. But that's very rare. So I would say not really often um, and only for specific things. That's really interesting. I didn't know that babies could be born with a teeth. Um, so do you work with orthodontists if children have braces? Yes. So um, a lot of times pediatric dentists will have an orthodontist in their office or a lot of pediatric dentists have orthodontists as part of their office. Our office, we share office space with an orthodontic practice practice. So we're two separate businesses, but we share the space. So it's really nice because a lot of our patients will go there and then we can chat with the orthodontist back and forth. But yes, I would say pediatric dentists and orthodontists are like BFFs in the dental world. <laughs> um, so other than the dental terms that you showed us, like when you talk to children, how, what other ways do you explain dental procedures to them? Um, so I'm a fan of, uh, in pediatric dentistry, we have these guidelines, which are really great. And they're free to look at at any time if you ever go to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Um, and so one of them is called Tell Show Do. So I use that pretty much every day, all day long, where I'll tell a child what we're going to do. I'll show them and then we'll do it. And so I find that that's helpful, um, you know, explaining procedures or distracting children. Like yesterday, I had a patient who loved Elsa. So we found little snowflakes and characters in her little cavity that I was cleaning out. And so things like that, distraction, tell, show, do, um, are helpful communication behavior management. We also do a pharmacological behavior management. So we'll use like laughing gas. Um, we use that a lot. We'll use oral sedation. Um, so I think the biggest thing is looking at each child as an individual and finding out what would work best for them and kind of tailoring all the tools in the toolbox for them. Um, so there's lots of little tricks and things. That we do. That's awesome. Um, I think that kind of answers the next question, which is how would you handle children that have anxiety? Um, unless sure. you want to add anything more to that. Um. I would say it's important to find out like where their anxiety or what it is that they're anxious of. A lot of kids I find are anxious of the unknown. So they just don't know what to expect. So I usually, before we even lay them back, I'll show them pretty much everything. Like I'm not going to show them the needle and anything like that. Um, but I'll show them as much as is appropriate just to kind of take the fear of the way they can see it. They can look at it. Um, but if they've had a negative experience before, those are kind of very hard to overcome. Um, so for those, we may use laughing gas or oral sedation just to kind of take the edge off um, and help them get through treatment successfully. Um, is it common for pediatric dentists to have call hours? Um, I kind of feel like for the most part, yes. I know there are some offices that don't, but I think, um, I don't mind being on call. It's honestly, I feel like a good thing, especially during COVID. We were on call like one day of the week, every week, um, just to give parents peace of mind. A lot of times you won't have to go in, um, you know, parents will send a picture, they'll text. Um, and just to reassure your parents and your patients, um, I think is a nice service to provide. But definitely in residency, you will definitely be on call and you'll definitely get called for all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but in real life, in practice, going in is far and few between, I would say.
but now that I've said that, I'm sure I'm going to get <laughs> a call. <laughs> um, so I think that's all the time we have for questions. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, Great. nonetheless, uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we, we have. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Gordon, sure. for, for sharing some of your professional Hi. insight with us. That was sure. uh, engaging and enriching and informa- informational um, and we just would like to wish you a productive year and we uh, hope everyone has a great night. You too. Thank you so much. This was fun. Take care. Yeah, you thank too. You so much. Uh, also, just to reiterate to, to all of our viewers and attendees, uh, the quiz should be posted in the chat and it can also be accessed through the bio uh, in our Instagram. But other than that, thank you so much and uh, take care.